A very good evening to all the listeners of Rehabilitation Science Group. Uh, today on this lovely Saturday evening, we have with us uh, Dr. K. Ganesan. Uh, Dr. Ganesan will be talking today about hamstrings in non-sport population, a rehabilitation overview. Uh, Dr. Ganesan himself uh, is master's in physiotherapy with specialization in sports and is currently the head of the department of physiotherapy and sports rehab at Ortho One, which is an orthopedic specialty center in Coimbatore. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Ganesan, and we hope uh, to have an interactive session with you today. Thank you very much, sir, for the uh, invitation. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with the uh, Rehabilitation Science Group. Uh, I have uh, followed up quite a number of uh, the sessions, what has been done over a period of this time. And uh, again, Harpreet sir, uh, Shagun sir, and Dharam sir, thanks for uh, this invitation. So can I start off with the uh, presentation? Yes, sir, yes. So uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, so my name is Ganeshan. I'm a sports physiotherapist. I run a company called Movement Solutions, uh, through which I've been conducting courses on taping and pilates and fitness. Currently, I'm the head of the department for Ortho One, Orthoscopic Specialty Center for Sports Medicine in Coimbatore. Uh, this is a center which was ranked about uh, number eight for uh, orthopedics, as is a pure uh, specialty for orthopedics. This is my uh, setup. It's a very small unit with uh, about 35 bedded, uh, but we do a lot of specialized uh, cases, uh, cold orthopedics in particularly with scopy in ACL, uh, meniscus, multi-ligament, PCL, posterior corner surgeries, uh, rotator cuff, latarge, bank cut. So a lot of those kind of works and uh, sports injuries. So this is my... Uh, uh, philosophy in, in rehab where I, for me, exercise is uh, one of the primary uh, source of uh, uh, treatment methodology for my uh, patients where I emphasize on exercise and I always say this that uh, there's no good or bad exercise. It's only the right choice and right form of exercise. Most of the time we make mistakes in the uh, choice and uh, the patients also make mistakes in the form of exercise. And that is when uh, the problem starts. So hamstrings is something which uh, uh, interests me a lot, not only in the post-surgical or in the uh, uh, sports patient, but even in our normal routine uh, rehab, what I have found are textbooks and in the clinical practice over a period of time, I see is the hamstring is regularly stretched uh, and you know strengthening of the hamstring is very uh, ignored. And until unless he's a fitness guy or he plays sports, they, they don't uh, plan to strengthen the hamstrings much. So coming on to the hamstrings, uh, we all know it's a three-part muscle and uh, it's primarily your biceps femoris, which has got a short head and a long head and followed by your semitendinosis and uh, semimembranosis. So which for, uh, is the posterior uh, group of muscle, which is primarily going to do your uh, knee flexion. So your short head, as you can see, it's a sort of a slightly diagonal uh, going towards the midline and the short head and extending onto the long head. That's your biceps femoris. Now there is something called as the fourth uh, hamstring. This is uh, uh, going to be with uh, your part of the uh, adductor magnus, your gastronemus, which is also a knee flexor, a secondary knee flexors, and the peroneus uh, longus, which can all form a continuous form as a kinetic chain as part of the deep posterior line. There's a superficial line and a deep posterior line. So this can be also a fourth hamstring uh, group. 
So you can see this uh, client of mine who's trying to do uh, knee flexion strengthening. So you can see that when he asks, when he's asked to do, you can see the angle how he goes. So if your angle is going towards the opposite shoulder, that means this hamstring or knee flexion is more uh, from the dominant of the short head and the long head. And if you can maintain your knee flexion towards your same side shoulder, then your dominance is more to do with your semi, uh, semi T, your membranosis and tendinosis. You can find this very common in patients when you ask them to do a knee flexion, they will be doing this. Now, in this case, you can see this patient's foot, how it is going into an external rotation. Now, this is your fourth hamstring. You will find people when they try to do your knee flexion, they will tend to go into that slight rotation where they are going to use the uh, adductor magnus and then they are trying to use the peroneus. Now, this is the client. I'm teaching him that you should not go use only the biceps. I want him to improve on the semi tendons, and he's trying to correct them. So you can see that he's making the change on the hip high team. So when you look at the posterior group of muscle, it has got your um, hamstrings, which is primarily there. And you have all these accessory muscles, which are around the posterior aspect from posterior to slightly going uh, onto the lateral or the media aspects, your uh, IT band, your vastus lateralis, your adductor magnus, gracilis, uh, your posterior compartment of uh, the calf muscle, everything is part of the posterior aspect. So coming on to the hamstrings, it is uh, the muscle which crosses the knee joint posteriorly. So all the muscles except the short head of the biceps is all biarticulate and they cross the um, uh, hip joint as well as the knee joint. So they bring in the biomechanical aspect of active and passive insufficiency. So there is going to be a force uh, production that will depend upon on what position your hip or knee is, whether it is going to be an open kinematic or a closed kinematic, uh, how it is going to be uh, producing the forces. Now, it is very important also to distinguish the uh, knee uh, flexors and the hip extensors uh, when you look at the rehab program. Uh, as we know, the hamstring is a biarticulate uh, muscle. It is also one of the uh, secondary hip uh, extensors along with the uh, gluteus maximus. So looking at uh, some of the key points of the hamstrings, uh, muscle fatigue is the primarily uh, uh, problem which causes the damage to the muscle. And if you find uh, the literature everywhere, you will find that Muscle fatigue is one of the key component to cause injury rather than the muscle tightness. And uh, the muscles tend to be more of a, a type 2 phosphate uh, fibers. So predominantly as runners are running activity, your hamstring uh, requirement is very important. Uh, the strength imbalance, as we all know that the quadriceps is uh, four uh, and the hamstring is three muscles, there is always a imbalance. So the strength of the quadriceps tends to uh, inhibit the function of the hamstring and often leads to fatigue much faster than uh, any other muscle. And uh, this can cause uh, the strain to come into the hamstring muscle and cause you a muscle uh, strain or a tear. So the nerve supply, uh, it is going to be your short head is going to be uh, by the common peroneal nerve. And the log head is going to be uh, with the uh, uh, tibial nerve. And uh, biomechanically, if you see when you run your heel, uh, the knee flexion, when, when you run, that propulsion is going to come with your hamstrings where it is going to pull. So the initial uh, propulsion, what you get from your foot, your hamstring and the glutes is in a kinetic uh, chain manner. Now, uh, when do people have problem with the hamstrings? It is uh, that uh, most commonly you find uh, in the end uh, stage of the swing phase. So when you are on a swing phase on a gate, you are going to do an eccentric lengthening of the 
hamstring group of muscles. And as it goes into eccentric, it is going to land on the heel where it is going to start taking over into a concentric action. Now, uh, this is the phase when the common injuries take place where they have a rupture. So that is uncontrolled eccentric uh, movement in the swing phase. Now, there are mechanoreceptors in the ACL uh, ligament and they provide information to the hamstring muscle to tell when to activate. So the common uh, mechanism of injury you will find with ACL is when the legs are placed and they are into going into a uh, rotationary movement. Now, if the uh, uh, mechanoreceptors are firing for an information to the hamstring and if the hamstring is not able to recruit, this can allow the forces to go into uh, the ligament and cause the ACL rupture. So this is your anteriorly or hands, uh, sorry, the ACL ligament. And if you see, uh, it's your hamstring comes from posterior and the fibers get attached on the lateral side and uh, medial side and comes towards the tibia. And this is how it is going to posteriorly pull your tibia to allow the movement. And this is all triggered by your mechanoreceptors from the uh, ACL. Now, coming on to the relationship between the hip extensors and the knee flexors, the gluteus maximus is called as the powerhouse and the gluteus medius. So, there is an overlapping of the muscles group in this. So, if you see the gluteus maximus is the most powerful muscle in the body and uh, capable of producing maximum uh, forces. And the hamstring uh, is along with them with the uh, adductor mag uh, magnus all contribute for the uh, flexion and the hip extension uh, motion of the lower limb. Uh, lumbopelvic hip rhythm, just like how you have the scapulohumeral uh, rhythm, lumbopelvic hip rhythm is very important when you see your clients. So a simple asking them to bend. So mostly you should not just look how far he can go and touch, but look at the quality of the movement. So you can see that in this, there is a pelvic thrust, which is going posteriorly. And you can see the hip is rotating nice. And uh, if you see this, you can see that uh, the pelvic mobility is lessened. And in this third image, you can see that the pelvis is uh, nicely rotated from the uh, hip joint. And the lumbar is more straighter. And yet they can all touch. So this will give us an indication that whether there is appropriate movement happening at the lumbopelvic hip rhythm. Now, hamstrings will influence this movement depending upon how weak or how tight the muscle is. So, if you look at this image, and uh, this is your center of gravity and how your pelvis is going to be uh, positioned, the iliofemoral ligament limits the extension uh, of the pelvis when it is tilted posteriorly. So, that's your iliofemoral ligament. Now, when there is a change in the center of gravity and there is going to be a slight anterior pelvic tilt, then at this point, the center of gravity tends to shift slightly above the uh, uh, head of the femur. So this is when there is going to be a struggle between your flexors of the hip and the gluteus maximus, where they will try to balance and bring the pelvis into neutral. Now, in this uh, diagram C, you will find that during an anterior pelvic tilt, the pelvis has tilted and the center of gravity shifts completely anterior. And now you will have to have the hamstrings firing in more to hold on to the pelvis uh, dropping down further. And if there is an excessive anterior pelvic tilt, you will find the gluteus maximus also gets lengthened. So we know that as your muscle gets length and too much, the firing capacity also decreases. So you will have the gluteus maximus and hamstring uh, struggling to fire and maintain that for a long time, which leads to fatigue and causes all these uh, injuries. So you can see this guy asking him to bending down and he can go down well and touch. 
but you can see how much thrust he is going on the uh, lumbo pelvic hip complex that he has to go away from the midline all the way only to get into that position. Now I'm trying to see if I can correct this. So I'm putting him against the wall and asking him to go and he starts struggling. Now this is purely because not of tight hamstring, but a very weak hamstring, which is not able to hold on to the body weight and go down. So a simple way is I'm having another therapist hold on. So he's not holding him very hard, just giving him a proprioceptive support and allowing. So all the while he feels the hamstring getting pulled up, which is not a, a, a tightness based feeling, but it is more of an eccentric load feeling. So now biomechanically, I've corrected the center of gravity, which has to be in the pelvis in its equilibrium and allowing the hamstring muscle to function. So it's a re-education program. And then we are going to try and see if this is lessened. In this self-program, I'm asking him to go further forward so that this does not thrust behind. And he is still able to do and touch the toes. So this is one way you can correct the lumbo pelvic hip rhythm, uh, allowing the hamstring to work at the uh, appropriate manner. And in turn, you have corrected the uh, pelvic and the center of gravity where it should be following, allowing the muscles to fire appropriately. So this is how your forward flexion has improved from before and now. Now coming on to the gastronomic uh, muscle. So it is uh, the plantar flexor uh, at the foot, but it's got a secondary function at the knee joint where it is also uh, the secondary knee flexors. Now, when you look at the concept of the kinetic chain, uh, the lower body is more of a closed uh, chain activities and all the sports, uh, what people do or play, walk, uh, stand, everything is a uh, closed kinematic uh, chain activity. Now, open kinematic uh, chain uh, uh, movements are all uh, activities where we use for isolated uh, joint uh, movement or isolated muscle function. So when you do a open kinematic and a closed kinematic activity, the kinematic forces that is acting on the body differs based on the ground reaction force. So what uh, movement and one joint produce a predictable movement in all the other joint will be happening in the closed kinematic, whereas in open kinematic, the, the uh, Segments are free, so it can have a different pattern of movement. So uh, we, we are familiar with uh, the open kinematic and closed kinematic chain exercises and the benefits. So uh, for me, there is no uh, saying that this is the best or that is the best. When I need to start my rehab where I find my muscles are le uh, less recruited, uh, we need to go into an open kinematic based uh, strengthening program to activate your hamstrings. And once you know the hamstrings are firing and you have a baseline strength, then you start progressing to the uh, closed kinematic chain exercises where they are going to add up the ground reaction force. There's going to be proprioception, kinesthetic sensation, all those things that is going to come. So both has to be used appropriately at the rehab depending upon the patient's problem. So considering during the surgical procedures, so if you see the surgical procedure uh, point of view, the open kinematic and closed kinematic will uh, change depending upon what kind of uh, surgery uh, that is done. So closed kinematic mostly are considered uh, safer uh, in, in the initial stage of ligament injuries. Uh, where there is going to be less amount of uh, stress uh, forces. But if there is going to be a meniscal, then you will be delaying that. And if it is a lateral meniscus, you will be delaying further because that's going to allow the shear force to move the lateral meniscus to at least uh, 11 mm uh, anteriorly. So the joint compressive forces also uh, increases when you do a, a closed kinematic chain exercises. So if you have a patient whose uh, joint stability is poor and uh, patient's proprioception on the knee joint is affected or he has a chondral defect which has been um, uh, surgery done and you need to 
uh, reinforce the uh, contrail defect, then the uh, closed kinematic chain exercises are started. So again, coming on to the uh, biomechanical, uh, biomechanical perspective, understand that open kinematic chain, you can isolate to a single joint. So you can work on the hamstrings uh, specifically as a single joint uh, knee flexors, and you can uh, correct whatever deficits you can see from the other muscles contributing. And uh, in, in the beginning of the rehabilitation, when an athlete is not able to perform a closed kinematic chain exercise, you can start with open kinematic so that the muscle uh, uh, function is maintained. You also have the mechanoreceptors coming into play, as I earlier also mentioned, how it can kick in the, um, the firing of the hamstrings with, from the ligaments uh, perspective. So uh, biomechanically, again, uh, the shock absorption uh, takes place from the foot uh, and uh, they are going in terms of the uh, ground reaction force all the way to the posterior chain because there is an eccentrically landing up of uh, the legs and you will find that um, you need to land with a slight uh, knee flexion about uh, 10 to 15 degree which uh, absorbs the force on the hamstring muscle. And this is a person doing a squat and again you can see how they make mistakes now, this is not the ideal way you do a ham, uh, sorry, squats. Uh, when you do a uh, squats, we would like to see less um, uh, anterior translation of the tibia. So, as you can see, he's going off from the uh, uh, center line. That means his hamstring is not uh, uh, doing a co contraction and his quadriceps is doing excessive eccentric load to do the squats. So when you do a close kinematic uh, squat, you will find when you move forward, the, the hamstring is not holding up and it is only the uh, quadriceps that is lengthening and loading up too much. And you will find a lot of the time people complaining of a, a knee pain coming when they do the squats. Now coming into the clinical applications, do tight calves, cause knee pain. Yes, a lot of the time you can find people complaining of knee pain and uh, you, if you are going to uh, release and start stretching the gastrocnemic muscle, you will find there is a reduction in the knee pain. It can be your uh, osteoarthritis knee pain and uh, medial joint line pain. The, there is also a connection between the hamstring muscle uh, which divides into five uh, uh, tendon groups and uh, gets inserted with the minister, with the capsular junction. So that, that releases the capsule, everything, and uh, starts allowing the pain relief. So generally, when you get a patient with a, with a knee joint, what we see is the surface. So keep understanding that uh, inside there are various ligaments and uh, various structures and the muscles which is crisscrossing. And any muscle which has got an injury can influence the knee joint and primarily in joint, we want to know the primary movement muscle, the quadriceps and the hamstrings. So you need to start checking their function. Uh, Contral defect, again, is uh, something which uh, you can get in people with elderly or with uh, other problems with uh, sporting at a younger age and then uh, picking up an injury. So when you find a tight and a tensed calf muscle, it could be one of the compensatory mechanism for an inhibited hamstring muscle. Now, this can cause pain on the knee joint and the pain can be a dull diffused pain. And uh, you will find that clinically all their special tests and radiological findings are all fine. Now, uh, in the concept of the kinetic chain, uh, if the hamstring gets inhibited, some, somebody else has to do a knee flexion. So that will be your gastroc and you will find in most of the patients who have a lower limb uh, problem, always the gastroc will be very tight. That means what it is the first anti-gravity muscle, the muscle first muscle, which is on the ground, taking in all the uh, ground reaction first, uh, forces. And if the hamstring shutdowns, the excessive forces is on the uh, gastroc. Uh, another uh, uh, aspect of the hamstrings going up uh, posteriorly is 
you can find your angle of what I said about the biceps femoris and semitendinosus. It is part of the line which goes to the sacrotuberous ligament and goes up on the fascia to the erector spinae muscles, the paraspinal muscles. And you can also find a lot of the people who complain of back pain just about where the quadratus lumborum is uh, involved. You can have people complaining of pain just about the upper lumbar or the lower thoracic. They can have a trigger or a spasm, which is possible when people have a poor hamstrings. So when you assess these patients who have a back pain, you check their hamstrings. Or these patients can be typically who say that when I run, I get a back pain. So you will find that wherever this is, uh, when you ask them to lie on a prone and do a flexion, you can find this part getting spasmodic. So assessment for me is about learning and assessment for learning. Both are very important. So every patient you, you assess with an open mind, you learn something. But if you are going to assess thinking that this is probably this is the case, then you miss out on some of the uh, key findings what you can pick. Now, these are simple things what we do on a routine, uh, how you can check an active and passive range of motion. So again, remember, if a person is able to do a 100 degree SLR, it is not good. That means he is more unflexible. Probably the muscle tone is less. There is no tone uh, which is trying to hold on. So ideally, if you want someone to do an SLR, it should be just around 80 degree, which can be an SLR based or you can have a 90, 90 degree and then you do a passive uh, extension. So these are other ways how uh, flexibility of the hamstrings or the posterior chain is looked. So this is your sit and reach. You can also ask them to do an active uh, SLR or a passive one with the knee straight. So this was one uh, uh, study which uh, they have done a systemic, uh, sorry, this is not, uh, this is on a questionnaire for uh, with about 500 subjects where they try to find out what kind of a job they do. And people were from the age group to uh, 20 to 65 and they, they took people with different uh, uh, job uh, they do, some who are uh, sitting, standing, and all those things. And they saw how is their hamstring muscle length and the lumbar lordosis. And they found that there was no correlation and they, they were able to tell that uh, what kind of a job you do and what kind of a lordosis or a hamstring uh, tightness or weakness you have does not correlate. So sometimes when we try to tell our patient it is because you are sitting and working, you are standing and working, that is not actually true. Uh, okay, this is uh, how you can do uh, uh, strength testing, which is very important when you look for hamstrings. So I always prefer the eccentric muscle testing. And when I do for the hamstrings, I do at uh, all levels. The left image I'm doing for biceps femoris. So I'm asking him to bend it towards the opposite shoulder. If I want semitendinosus, I will ask him to take it towards the same side shoulder. So I will know which is more weak. And in the right video, you can see I'm doing an eccentric testing at 90 degree, at 45 degree and 50 degree. Because this is going to be the angle when you do an eccentric uh, gait cycle or running where the hamstring strain happens. So we will know which angle is more weaker. Okay, this is one uh, patient and you, you would have seen these kind of patients a lot. I'm asking him to do a uh, gluteus maximus activation. So hip extension, I'm trying to strengthen him and you can see every time he can kick in with his hamstrings. So this patient's uh, gluteus maximus is inhibited so much that he is completely been using the hamstring. So what happens to the active and passive insufficiency if the hamstring is more uh, supporting your hip extension, it tends to go uh, weak or biomechanically disadvantaged on the knee flexion. And you can find this gastroc being very hard. That means what the gastroc is now doing the function of the knee joint. <coughs> so uh, putting in on a knee strengthening program, you can see the dominance, how these guys. So this is uh, biceps femoris dominance, how he is going. So 
This patient, when we try to correct, now you can see the peroneus muscle coming into the play and you can see how his foot tends to go. So I don't want him to go on the biceps femoris angle. I wanted him semitendinosus. And uh, with the band, now I'm trying it on the uh, equipment. Again, uh, the advantage with the equipment is the angle will be fixed, but you can still see how his foot dominance tends to go. So he starts using the gastroc more now. So coming on to the injuries, uh, the common uh, thing you can find with hamstring is a hamstring strain. You can just have a, a erythema, a mild uh, tear on the muscle fiber and you can have the muscles involved. And uh, a good uh, grade two or grade three, usually players tend to say that I, I did feel uh, a pop sound which can indicate the tear on the muscle. In the general population, mostly we don't get a tear. It will be more of a grade one, which they can say that I get pain more around the knee joint or slightly around the gluteal region. And uh, the common cause for hamstring strain or injury is uh, when, when you do a, a biomechanically bad activity, when you are into a prolonged sitting portion, there is an imbalance in the muscles already with you and there is a sudden increase in the uh, walking uh, duration. So your biomechanical uh, uh, component is the uh, primary source of uh, uh, hamstring strain and any of the uh, imbalances on the lumbopelvic hip complex or the quadriceps or the foot can cause your hamstring pain. So multiple theories, what can cause is uh, hamstrings and quadriceps contract together and then they can have a uh, difference in the force and cause a strain. Uh, change from uh, hip extender to a knee flexor, like I said earlier, how the muscle has to compensate at work. Fatigue, uh, already existing poor posture. There is a, a leg length uh, discrepancy happening. Uh, lack of uh, primary flexibility and uh, strength imbalances on the muscle. So signs and symptoms, grade one, you will have a smiled uh, point pain and probably 20% 20 20 of fibers torn. You can just work on them. It's only the grade two and grade three which needs uh, immediate medical attention where you might need a, a scan and then uh, go on. A high-end uh, athlete who has got a hamstring injury can have a grade one and still go back within a week to play. So this is uh, the recommended uh, management, what you can use when you have a hamstring injury. Uh, kinesiology taping for hamstring strain or a blunt injury. This is uh, the lymphatic technique where you can see how it can remove it. So this is the fourth day of the patient. On the first day after the application, pain is gone. This is the uh, third day we have applied. And you can see on the fourth and fifth day, it's absolutely fine. Uh, another thing is the uh, aversion injury when there is a forceful uh, uh, knee uh, eccentric um, action. You can have an aversion injury which needs a surgical uh, fixation and uh, rehab for about four months and then back to sports. Some of the exercise principles. So understand open kinematic and close kinematic. Uh, you can do an isolated muscle work to improve the strength and then progress to functional training. Resistance training for your hamstrings, you can use any of them, your body weights, your uh, resistance, cuff weights, everything, all of the missions. So use muscle lengthening rather than stretching. Use passive stretches, active lengthening, eccentric lengthening. And always look for progression. Now, this is a hamstring activation. You can see I'm adding up an imbalance over here. And if you ask them to do a single uh, bridge, you will get the hamstring activation. Uh, another thing what you can ask them to is, as you go up, ask him to push the knee forward and you will find the hamstring recruiting very well in the patients. You can also use a Swiss ball. So I'm asking the patient to press the heel so your hamstring gets activated and then you are moving the hip. So I'm getting both the knee and the hip component coming into the play. If not the Swiss ball, I can use a chair the Swiss ball adds a little bit of wobbliness and then allows the muscle to fire in and improves the stability. So I can change the angle for uh, the activation. 
and these are other simple ways to get the uh, hamstring activated so high sitting asking him to do flexion and this is with the resistance band what he is able to do you can also do it in prone as i earlier also had shown using a cuff weights trying to do the hamstring strengthening a uh, little more on the open kinematic using a gym equipment and doing this you can also go with a single leg and perform them this is a closed chain hamstring uh, action so you can find that eccentric lengthening this is the nordic uh, hamstring you can have this modified version even for your patients who are not athletic population you can use a nice uh, resistance band over here and you can see how even if they go a small angle it is good you can also modify it with a swiss ball over here you can ask them because uh, strengthening the hamstring eccentrically is one of the best thing and these are other methods where you can use a simple uh, swiss ball and ask him to do uh, the uh, controlled lengthening you can also do that with a, a foam roller stretching of the hamstrings uh, if you have the leg extended and if you're going to ask him to bend down it is going to stretch more of the lower fibers and if you can keep him upright and ask him to go more further forward it is going to stretch the upper fibers uh when you ask them to do in a sitting portion your posterior chain uh from the lower limb gets fixed so you can have more stretches coming from the uh, lower back and uh, maybe the gastroc to some extent so the same component can be used where you ask them to move their head closer to the knee and you can ask them to be upright and ask them to go so you can get the upper and lower fibers um uh, hamstring lengthening active lengthening program so you can see using a strap and then just pulling it up and you can add multi direction so you can get the five uh, fibers of short head and the semi membranous tendinous is separate uh balance based exercise again a very important one to uh, incorporate not only in the sporting population but even in the elderly and oa group because that is going to activate and bring in a balance between the uh, pelvis uh, <coughs> how i said about the glutes and the hamstrings to bring into control so the take home message uh, hamstrings do not need stretching always evaluate and correlate with the uh, problem what the patient is uh, saying understand the biomechanics and the functional problem of the patient and see how your hamstrings uh, will be fitting into them uh, always combine uh, open kinematic and a closed uh, kinematic chain uh, exercise component when you are working on the lower limb and uh, particularly for the hamstrings always check for the muscle activation during functional activities even though you would have done an activation when you are doing a functional activity for a patient please check again whether the muscle is activating in that group and uh, check for the hip foot trunk as part of the global assessment uh, like how the hamstring gets influenced by the uh, foot or from the lumbopelvic hip uh, complex uh, for its function so that's about it thank you very much yeah thank you dr ganesan for this wonderful talk and uh, uh, an informative session of uh, simple exercises uh, which can be clinically followed by every therapist and uh, easy to understand uh, the difference between uh, the medial or the lateral hamstring the upper or the lower Uh, so th this was very informative uh, there was just one question that uh, uh, when do you actually choose uh, close kinetic exercises and open kinetic so do you look for some specific indications to do that uh, if the patient is uh, going to have a knee uh, injury involving either the meniscus or the ligament yes okay that will give me the idea whether to go with closed or open kinematic so let's right. take an example if it is going to be a meniscal strain it doesn't have to be a big tear or you know it just has a meniscal tray, uh, strain he's right so i will start off telling him continue with open kinematic and yes. after two weeks we will go to closed kinematic okay 
Okay. If it is an uh, ACL strain, then I, I can see that if it is only a partial tear or just a strain, then by assessment, if he is not having much of a problem and he's able to recruit the quadriceps and hamstring, fine with closed kinematic. Right. Uh, and uh, finally, Dr. Ganesan, uh, just one more question was there that uh, can kinesio taping, taping also enhance uh, the the functioning of the muscle? Uh, definitely, uh, kinesiology taping can uh, help in uh, the function of the muscle. But we have to understand that kinesiology taping is like if your car is not starting, you put the tape and you just get it started. Right. So the patient can at least for the next three, four days with the tape on, maybe with less pain and will be able to do the exercise. Okay. Right. So by one week, the muscle starts firing and recruiting and then it takes over. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ganesan, for a wonderful evening and an informative session. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.